talking to Jim Silver, who was the minister of Pequannock Community Church. Um, and really what we're after is for you to take us back to October 3rd, 1979. And tell us a little bit about who you were and about your church. As I think back about that experience, uh, I, there are a host of memories, uh, lots of them. I, uh, and I, some of them are negative, uh, but really most of them are positive. Now, I, I don't want to forget those three people that died in that terrible tragedy, but again, um, so much of what came out of that was positive, uh, not right at the moment, because it was a terrible situation, but uh, as you I reflect on it now, so much came out that was positive. There was a lot of, um, you could say, faith, love, and hope in the community at that time. I have uh, many, many memories, as everybody does, <laughs> who was uh, there at that time, and uh, everybody who was there could remember exactly what happened at 2.54 <laughs> on the afternoon of uh, October 3rd. I have some very dramatic memories. I was in the church building, the Pequanti Community Church, in my office, and um, it was raining uh, uh, enormously. And, uh, and I heard this noise. It was like a, uh, a freight train going down Pequannock Avenue. But it was so strange because it just began and there was no change in volume or pitch. And I realized that I'd never heard anything like this before. So I didn't know what it was, but I sensed that this was not something good. So I actually, went into the stairwell and put my uh, jacket over my head. Uh, and then the noise stopped, just as dramatically it started it ended. I, I had no idea what this was. So I went back to my office. And then I, there was a door between my office and the sanctuary, so I opened the door. And I stood there and remember saying, oh my God. Oh my God, several times, because there was this gaping hole in the roof and the rain was pouring down and there was debris everywhere. Um, and then, after a few minutes, the sun came out. And uh, I uh, went outside to see what was going on and um, uh, a volunteer fireman, um, Kenneth Smith was out in the road and he said to me, why don't you go over to the school and see if the people there are okay? And there was a Girl Scout troop there. So I went into the school and they were fine. I had to walk through a, uh, a load of um, uh, slate shingles that had blown off the school roof. So I went there and then, then I walked over to Hollow Brook <laughs> and the devastation was, I mean, tremendous. There were uh, pieces of houses all over the place. And um, so I went up and down the street to find out how people were doing. Uh, as it so happened, um, one of the houses uh, was lived in by a couple named Rain and Helgi Peel. And they were personal friends of my family. And their house had been picked up with them inside of it and had lift, been lifted up and was across the street. Uh, they had some bumps and bruises, but uh, people were, were, were basically okay. It was an eerie situation because there was an absolute silence. And I uh, thought, where are the emergency vehicles? Doesn't anybody know what's going on here? <laughs> and here's the sun shining, and, and nothing is happening. Uh, and I, 
it seemed like a good half an hour that I was walking up and down that street after I'd come out of the church sanctuary, and nothing was happened. I, I heard later that lots of people were up at the bank because the two people had died up there. And also that they it took them a while to get through some of the debris to get there. But uh, so there was quiet at one moment, and then bang. <laughs> All the emergency vehicles, the fire trucks, a payloader, ambulance, the police cars just descended on the community. Uh, later that afternoon, I uh, drove um, back to my home, and it was some distance away, and there was no damage there. Uh, and um, I remember going across the Farmington River Bridge. And by that time, all the access roads had been basically closed because they didn't want people who were unauthorized to come through. So folks who lived in that area had to park on the other side of the bridge and then walk. And I remember seeing all these people walking down uh, the sidewalk at the bridge with their briefcases and remembering the looks on their faces. Uh, they were thinking, I mean, there was such a stare in the look, wondering, what has happened to my home? What has happened to my family? What is the future for me? I, I, that image was so clear. Um, the. Uh, I think at times like this, people are looking for uh, signs that will help them deal with the tragedy and help them to feel they can move on. We had uh, several situations for the church, Paguada Community Church, where I was the pastor at that time. One of them was the day after the tornado, uh, Ford Ransom Jr was uh, helping me sort through the debris in the sanctuary. He was standing in the back of the church, and he uh, said to me, uh, Pastor, did you have, I found the uh, pulpit Bible under some debris in the back of the church. It had been lifted up by the tornado and deposited back there. And he said, did you have this pulpit Bible open to the book of Ezra? And I said, oh, no, I never preached from the book of Ezra. <laughs> he said, look at this. He shouted to me across the pews. It's open to Ezra 5.11. Now, the book of Ezra has to deal with the Jewish people uh, rebuilding the temple after a, they'd had a terrible disaster when it had been destroyed uh, many years previous. So he said, Look what I'm reading, and I, 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 I want to get the exact words, because the Jewish people are seeing to the Persian authorities what they're doing. And they respond in Ezra 5.11, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the house that was built many years ago. And so the church took this as a symbol to rebuild. Um, and that, that verse became so valuable to us uh, as a church. Uh, foolishly, uh, a number of months later, I suggested that we should think in terms of getting rid of the Bible because it was a bit torn as a result of the storm. Well, <laughs> that brought a, on a hue and cry, whoa! <laughs> This is a precious book to us, and we have to preserve it. So it has been preserved and put in a special place for all these years. Um, we, uh, time went on, and we wondered what we should do with the sanctuary. We, we couldn't um, worship in it uh, anymore uh, at that point, and we wondered, should we just repair the roof, or what to do? Uh, we couldn't figure out where we were with that. Well, in mid-January, that following January, 
there was a, uh, a freak uh, warm spell and a wind came up from the south and knocked down the south wall of the building, which had been staying up. Come to find out, the roof was holding the walls in place. And over the years, water had seeped into the walls and had deteriorated the cement so that you could go and pick up bricks out of the wall. <laughs> well, when we saw that, the unanimous sense was, knock it all down. Knock it all down, because it's not safe. So, so we did that. And we said, Let, well, we got to start from scratch. But what does scratch mean? Do we just rebuild it the way it was, or do we go into something new, as it happened? Also that month, I went to a program in Boston uh, for a number of days, which dealt with having a new vision for the church. That was the theme. So I came back and was able to say to the congregation, look, we got a wonderful opportunity to do something entirely new. Uh, the old sanctuary was on the second floor. There was no accessibility for wheelchairs. It was energy inefficient. Um, we didn't have room in the um, uh, foyer to greet people. We had very little room in the chancel area where the communion table and choir were. And we, and we said, why don't we build it all on one floor? and have a new, the fellowship hall had been destroyed too, and have a new sanctuary, fellowship hall, make it energy efficient, give ourselves lots of room in uh, the chancel area, so if we want a big choir there or a concert there, we can do it. Let's, let's really think new. And uh, the congregation bought into that. And, and so we proceeded with that. Um, and we had lots of help in doing all this. Uh, the community really responded. And I have a f sense that because the church was right there on Paquantic Avenue, the main drag, uh, people were going by this all the time, that there could have been a sense among many that they'd like to see the building restored as some symbol for them that the community was rising above the debris. Uh, the church congregation responded enormous, enormously. The people were so generous, generous, they dug into their pockets, and we developed all kinds of ways to finance what we needed to do. Um, it, uh, that was challenging, but the people rose to the challenge. And the community was such a help. Um, Bruce Chamberlain uh, got together a crew of men who then put on a fundraising chicken barbecue for us. Now, we had no kitchen. That had been destroyed. So they did it all outside, and people came from all of the churches and everywhere in the community. And I remember uh, my office had not been destroyed. That section of the building had not been destroyed. So my office was loaded with apple pies from the floor to the ceiling. <laughs> and for months afterwards, I was picking up crumbs. But it was a wonderful thing that people did. And um, Father James Doherty of the of St. Joseph's Church came over and said to me, well, if you have need of a sanctuary, we are very willing to provide it for you. So I had a wedding there, and we also had our Christmas Eve service there because we just couldn't accommodate that. We were able to, with the part of the building that was not destroyed, uh, remove a wall, and so we were able to have, continue with worship services. It was a real tight 
fit, but we were able to do that. And I remember Lon Pelton, who uh, had a crane, because he was in the construction business, he came over and said, I'd like to take the bell, which was in the debris of the steeple which had fallen down, I'd like to take that out and put it on a tripod out on your lawn uh, as, again, a symbol that we were not just uh, overwhelmed by the debris, but we, we were going to, so to speak, rise from the ashes. So that was, that was wonderful. Um, we got contributions from people all over the country. I remember getting a contribution from, to help rebuild from a synagogue in uh, Illinois. And we got a contribution from the um, Haddam, Connecticut Congregational Church. Um, and then shortly after they sent a contribution in November, their church burned down. So some of our congregants said, well, they sent us a contribution. We ought to send them one. There are others who said, well, that seems foolish. <laughs> we need the money ourselves. But the overwhelming sense was, you know, what would Jesus want us to do in this situation? And it was, well, you know, Jesus would want us. We've been helped. We ought to help somebody else. So from that time on, it was decided that on the anniversary of the tornado, the church would take up an offering for any house of worship that we saw had been damaged or destroyed by fire or windstorm or flood. And as far as we, I know, they still do that every year, take up a an offering for someone, for some church that uh, is needy. There were some humorous things, and um, one was um, a number of people couldn't help but make a comment, well, your facility, a Protestant church, was destroyed, but St. Joseph's had no damage whatsoever. <laughs> now, as it turned out, in later years, they found out there was, had been significant damage to their steeple because of the tornado, but they just didn't realize it at the time. Well, to that, we just had to respond. Oh, you know, tornadoes work mysteriously and no explanation. But we had to smile at that. And then we had to smile at the affair of the trees. Now, for a number of months prior, we in the church had been talking about how our facility was uh, not seen from the road as cars went by because we had so many trees blocking the view. So the executive committee had said, well, why don't we take down some of the trees? And we announced on the Sunday before the tornado that we were thinking about bringing down the trees. Well, one of the members of the church, who was an avid <laughs> supporter of trees, stood up and said, no way can you do this. Trees are a gift of God. If you do this, this is terrible. So we said, all right. I guess we'll have to have a congregational meeting in a couple of weeks and sit down and talk about it. Now, that was on the Sunday. On the Wednesday came the wind. Somebody counted 68 trees were removed. There was only one left. That was a big maple right out in front, and uh, it had lost a major limb. So <laughs> there was a common consensus among our folks. Well, 
the Lord said, enough is enough. I'm going to take care of the situation for you. Needless to say, we um, canceled <laughs> the meeting to talk about the trees. So, as I look back, it, it, in many ways, well, it was a very hard thing at first. And people had to really struggle, and we in the church had to struggle, but in the long run, there was so much that positive because of the uh, low cost, uh, small, small business loans that people were able to get. They uh, were able to build houses that were bigger, more comfortable, better. Uh, the church, its spirit was fantastic. We felt God was really supporting and moving us. And we came out with a structure that was so much better suited to our ministry for God and for the community. So it was in many ways with this building that was going on, it was exhilarating to be part of that. And the sense of spirit in the community, which was very much, you know, we'll get through this. What an opportunity to be better than we ever were. So as I look back on it, it was a high point in my life to be part of the church at that point and to be part of the community. I have great memories. The sadness, of course, for especially for the people who died, but um, you know, all in all, great positive memories. What eloquence. Thank you. You are welcome. Just a couple of follow-up questions. You were one of the first people on the scene, and you knew. Um, you probably have a sense because you're a, a pastor. Um, what did people need in those hours right after? I think people were numb. They were in a state of shock. I, I think one thing was, are you okay? How are you doing? Um, do you have any uh, wounds or... Um, and then to say, you know, uh, um, well, but uh, there's all this destruction, but actually, you got through it. Mm -hmm. And um, you've got your life and your family and your children and your, your, the people you love. And uh, hey, this is, this is material stuff. This can be built up. Mm -hmm. Did you find yourself saying that? To yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned the barbecue barbecue and I wonder if you could tell us about when that was I think that was very quickly very quick I it's probably early November people rallied very quickly mm -hmm. and as all the, all the church ministers came and visited me uh, came to this church and and said, what can we do to help? Um, wasn't easy at, for me at first to even figure out. I was in a state of shock too. Where do we go from here? Uh, um, but it was wonderful to have that support.
I, I think, uh, I think you asked a follow-up question. I, um, I didn't really get to sneak in here, but it's, if there's more to expand on, but um, did uh, what was the emotional? Um, what were some of the hard things for your parishioners? You were you were trying to lift them up and. And and uh, and you were you were working together for this this wonderful you know rejuvenation of your church. But what did you see besides that? What did you see them struggling with? Um, and and how did you how were you able to help them? There was a low point when um, we realized that we had to knock down the old sanctuary and fellowship hall and that we were needed to rebuild and um, the uh, we found out that the cost to rebuild was going to be around six hundred thousand dollars now this is back in 1979 and they uh, told us the insurance people, who really were very good to us, said um, that uh, the way the insurance worked out, we could get about 300000 And I remember when we had the congregation gathered together to hear what the insurance was going to give us. And so that meant we had to get a, raise about 250000 or 300000 And I remember when we heard that, the glum looks on people's faces. How are we ever going to do this? I remember everybody going home, go, leaving the uh, church building and rather downcast. The next Sunday, people came back. <laughs> and for some reason, the whole spirit had changed, and people came back saying, we can do it. It was dramatic how the spirit had changed from that one day during the week, that night when they left to go home and were just so downcast. I don't know what happened. Well, I say it was the Holy Spirit of God was moving, and they said, we'll find a way. Even to the point where people borrowed on their life insurance policies and the church said, well, look, we'll pay the interest. And, and then over a period of time, I don't know, it was 10 years or 15 years, we paid back the principal to all these folks who borrowed on their life insurance policies to uh, help us get through this 